Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the delegation of the opposition parties visiting Manipur. We also talk about why India withdrew its martial arts contingent from a tournament taking place in China. But first, we talk about the bill to amend the Forest Conservation Act, which was passed in the Lok Sabha last week. The act, which was first passed in 1980, tried to make sure that all lands classified as forests in government records were protected. And later, in 1996, a landmark ruling of the Supreme Court extended the act's ambit to all lands that satisfied the dictionary definition of a forest, which meant that the act would also protect forests that were not classified as forests in government records. But now the latest bill, which was passed in the Lok Sabha, effectively nullifies the Supreme Court's order and also gives exemptions to certain kinds of infrastructure and development projects from getting a forest clearance, which is mandatory right now. In this segment, we speak to Indian Express's Amitabh Sinha about this bill. Amitabh, firstly, tell us in what way does this bill nullify the 1996 Supreme Court order? Yeah, seemingly it does, right? In effect, it looks like that this bill is going to nullify the 1996 Supreme Court order, which basically said anything that looks like a forest must be considered a forest as far as this law is concerned. And this law, I mean Forest Conservation Act of 1980. Now, what does the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 says? It doesn't prevent cutting down of trees, right? It doesn't say you cannot cut down trees. Forest Conservation Act says that if you have to cut down trees, you have to take the permission of the what is called the forest forest department or what is called the forest advisory committee. So basically, you have to get a forest clearance. And if the government thinks that your need is legitimate and is required, it will give you a forest clearance based on certain criteria, right? So the Supreme Court in 1996 said that no. The original 1980 Act, as you say, was meant only for government recorded forests, the areas that were recorded as forest land. Right, but the Supreme Court in 1996 said that it will apply to every area that looks like a forest, basically taking into account the canopy cover. And now this new amendment changes that again. Yeah, now with this amendment, the government seems to be going back to the 1980 Act effectively nullifying the supreme court order saying only the land that is classified as forest land that will be you know this forest conservation act would apply to only those land not outside of forests so let's say there is a forest but it's not recorded as a forest in government records so if and when this bill becomes a law you won't require a clearance to cut it down yes because till now what was happening is supposing you or i grew forest if we had say 5 hectares of land to spare and if we decided to do agroforestry on that land for example if we wanted to grow bamboo on that for economic reasons we could very well grow but for cutting down those forests for cutting down trees for selling it to the market we would need forest clearance from the government because even if you're growing trees privately it still counts as a forest it still counts as forest according to the supreme court order right and because that land was also classified as forest by supreme court and therefore the forest conservation act used to apply to that because of which not many people would get into you know agroforestry for these kind of reasons because you would need to as an individual it gets very difficult for you to go to government and get a clearance every time you want to cut down your trees so that was considered a hindrance to the growth of forest outside forest areas so one objective of the government a stated objective of the government is to increase the forest cover of india which is right now about 21% of india's total land and the stated objective it's a very ambitious thing is to take the forest cover to 33% of india's land now that cannot happen unless you grow the area you 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 grow the area of forest land and land is a scarce commodity so the argument is the argument from the government side is that we need to promote private forestry 
and agroforestry business and if people find value in growing forests which they can use for their own economic benefit then a lot of people would be encouraged to grow forest if they have land available but amitabh the forests that one grows for commercial purposes are not the same as natural ones right where different kinds of animals live and which support a whole other kind of ecosystem so it's not the same but there are some benefits that you can have even from these forests specifically for example if you are looking at carbon sequestration which is an important objective right now basically those private forests can still absorb a lot of co2 they can become carbon sinks carbon sinks and that's an important consideration in the current context because india has an international ob- obligation to increase its carbon sink it has an international commitment to do 2.5 to 3 billion tons of additional carbon sink so from that perspective even private forests they count in a very significant way the other consideration of course is economics it can be a profitable business for a lot of farmers if you allow them to cultivate say teak for example there is huge demand for wood in the country which currently india imports almost like 60000 crore of timber every year because your local demand is not being fulfilled from your own forests so there is a demand for the, and it can be a very lucrative sort of an economic activity for individual farmers for companies so that's the second consideration right of course as i say the natural forests are very very different from these kind of you know private forests or agroforestry business and they do not provide the same kind of services okay so the stated objective of this bill seems to be to encourage private forests which would enable india to increase its forest cover but because with this amendment we go back to the original act it also makes it easy to clear forests which are not officially classified as forest right yes it does become easy so that's that's the toss up so you can always argue that the forests that were outside of designated forest areas they had a certain kind of protection under the supreme court order which now goes away therefore it becomes easier to clear those forests and therefore it would lead to higher degree of deforestation now that argument can very well be made okay namita besides this the other thing that this bill proposes to do is exempt certain kinds of projects from getting a clearance which is mandatory right now could you talk about what kind of projects these are so the bill mentions three different kinds of projects one you know in the border areas if a linear project is located within 100 kilometers from an international border or the lse or loc as the case might be then that project would not be uh, requiring a forest clearance now by linear project i mean projects like highways or railways which move more or less no require linear kind of land so that is one sort of project that has been exempted the other is if again in this same areas near the border areas if the project is not linear but you require a large amount of land is spread over a certain area if that kind of project also is strategic in nature it's considered necessary for the security of the country then if it's a project of the size not bigger than 10 hectares in area then even that would be exempt from forest clearance so linear projects any length of linear project within 100 kilometers from international border if it's a non linear project then the size has to be within 10 hectares right so both these are exempt then there is a third category which has been uh, exempted which is in the naxal affected areas for example those areas where there are certain classification but basically areas which are of the size of 0.1 hectares and which are close to uh, already constructed road or 
and are in the nature of being public amenities for example if you have to construct a bathroom in a school or those kind of things so up to a size of 0.1 hectares even in the naxal affected areas even that is it has been exempted from forest clearances and what has been the reasoning behind doing this so look this is not the first time it is happening right there have always been certain kind of projects which have remained exempt from forest clearance and from time to time the kind of projects that get this kind of exemption keeps getting revised mainly on security grounds so basically why do the exemptions why are the exemptions given no so forest clearance actually takes a lot of time so that is one factor so and there are certain projects which the government wants to expedite so time is one factor number one number two there are certain projects for example that you have to build a road connectivity or a telecommunication line or even mining for example which are considered important for you know national development for security reasons but if you just look at it from the forest conservation principle then because you are cutting down forests only from the forest conservation principle these these projects might get turned down but because these projects are considered important enough therefore in certain cases the government says okay these kind of projects would not require a forest clearance right so these are not new from time to time they get revised what we saw last week is just a fresh revision and addition of new projects to the exemption list and amitabh could you speak to some of the concerns that have been raised about this especially considering that a lot of these areas we're talking about do have ecologically sensitive zones so it's an age old debate should you conserve forests or should you be also able to mine your underground resources because those are important as well and if you look at india's map you know the forest map the minerals map and unfortunately also the naxal map of india they overlap almost you know they are almost the same so there is a security issue there is a resource issue and there is also the need to protect your forests and conserve your forests and obviously all these three objectives are not in sync you know they clash with each other so you have to have sort of you have to balance it out and in trying to balance that you will have to give in somewhere and you have to say no to certain kind of projects saying no we don't need that and maybe sometimes you'll have to you know make a compromise with your rigid stance on forest conservation as well so that kind of balance has to be struck what is the right balance that is the whole debate you know all about and that's a continuing debate and there is no satisfactory answer frankly because there are people on both sides people who are very ardent forest forest conservationists who would say any amount of cutting a forest is a problem there are others who would argue that look your forest laws are a hindrance to your country's development so that's a very old argument and it continues to play out throughout and next we talk about the delegation of opposition parties visiting manipur over the weekend 21 mps from the opposition alliance india visited manipur to assess the situation in the state where ethnic violence broke out on the 3rd of may between the dominant mathes and the kuki tribes and these ongoing clashes have taken more than 140 lives so far and led to a complete breakdown of law and order in the state Now this visit comes after the opposition alliance moved a no confidence motion against the BJP government during the ongoing monsoon session of the parliament and this was done in a bid to coerce the government into having an exhaustive discussion on the Manipur crisis Now during the visit the MPs met people in relief camps and also spoke to tribal leaders to understand the ground reality Here's MP Shushmita Dev from the TMC and Congress leader Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary speaking to the media about it. दुख यही है कि भारत सरकार को डेलीगेशन भेजना चाहिए था उन्होंने मना कर दिया इसलिए इंडिया अलायंस की जो जितनी पार्टीज हैं उनके सांसद यहां आए हैं ये जानते हैं कि ये सरकार हमें कुछ नहीं मदद करेंगे सरकार के भरोसे चले गए इन लोगों को ये बड़ा भयानक स्थिति पैदा हो चुकी है ये मैं जरूर कहना चाहता हूं कि आप ये मत सोचो कि यहां की सरकार कुछ टू नो मोर अबाउट द की टेक अवे फ्रॉम दिस विजिट माय कॉलीग उच्चा सारमिन स्पीक्स टू इंडियन एक्सप्रेसेस सुकृता बरवा 
So Sukrita, the delegation from 16 opposition parties went to Manipur over the weekend. Can you first tell us what were the arguments given by them for this visit? So, as you know, that uh, this visit is happened during the course of the ongoing parliament session, right? And we know that the Manipur issue has been brought up very vociferously by the opposition, and and it's stalled parliament proceedings for a while, right? Because the opposition parties have been demanding that the prime minister make a statement on the floor of the house, and the Congress has also moved a no confidence motion against the current government over this issue. So um, this visit should be seen in the light of all these issues. It's largely to mount pressure on the government to keep the issue alive till the discussion on the no confidence motion happens. So what many of the MPs said before the visit, during the visit and after is that they want to witness firsthand, speak to victims of the violence so that they can competently and adequately present and uh, place their findings before the floor of the house during these discussions. And could you tell us what were some of the key things that the MPs did after reaching Manipur? Right, so they reached uh, on the afternoon of 29th July. And so then they split into two teams. And the, the first thing that they did was go to Churichanpur, which is one of the main epicenters of the conflict. And it's a cookie zomi dominated area. So they visited relief camps there. And uh, they spent time there. They met civil society leaders there in the relief camps. They met the uh, people living in relief camps are the people who've been displaced by the violence. And among the people living in the relief camps, they met family members of the three women, actually, who were um, stripped and sexually assaulted in Manipur on May 4th, right? which is the incident which became prominent because of a widely circulated video. So. Sushmita Dev from the TMC and uh, Kani Muri from the DMK, they met uh, family members of these victims. And after Churichanpur, they headed back to Imphal by Chopper and then they went to relief camps in methe dominated areas. So one team went to relief camps in Moirang, which uh, also saw a lot of conflict and a large relief center in Imphal as well. So this is largely what panned out on the first day of the visit. Right, and on the first day only, the Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum submitted a memorandum to the MPs, right? Could you tell us what were the main highlights of this memorandum? Right, so the memorandum basically, you know, highlighted ki what they said were the sufferings of the Kuki Zomi community. And they reiterated two key demands that the community has been raising since the start of the conflict. One, of course, we all know is the demand for a separate administration. So they asked the opposition MPs to support their demand, to put their weight behind the demand for a separate administration for Kukizomi territories. And the second demand that they asked for support is for the imposition of president's rule in the state, because these community leaders have repeatedly expressed a lack of faith and confidence in the Bahrain Singh-led BJP government in the state. So these are the two key demands that they, they flagged in their communication to the opposition MPs. Okay, so based on their assessment, this delegation from the Opposition Alliance prepared a memorandum and handed it over to the state governor, Anusuya Wiki, on Sunday. So, could you tell us what they said to the governor? So, among the things that the MPs flagged, both to media persons and to the governor, was that they said that what they found by meeting victims from both sides of the conflict is that there appears to be, I quote, anger and a sense of alienation amongst all communities. So they said that this is something that needs to be addressed. Of course, they flagged down the the breakdown of the law and order machinery in the state and said that the union government and the state government, so the overall state machinery has uh, failed to contain the conflict, especially since even, you know, in the last few days, there have been incidents of firing and arson which have continued to take place in the state even like three months into the conflict. So they flagged that. They also said that they found the conditions in the uh, relief camps to be quite pitiable, especially in the case of uh, children and students whose studies and teaching and learning has been completely jeopardized and, uh, you know, just haywire in the last three months. And uh, they also flagged the continuing internet bans. So they said that this seems to be doing more harm than good. And, you know, this is actually fueling more misinformation and rumors because there's lack of information because of this. So these are among the things. And then ask the governor in the memorandum to apprise the union government 
of the status in the state. So these are among the things that they flagged in the memorandum to the governor. And after coming out from the meeting, they said that the governor expressed her support to, to, to their observations and said that an all-party delegation should be formed so that they come and meet the leaders of the Mete and Kuki communities. And uh, this is something that uh, Congress, I mean, opposition has been also harping on before that, you know, they've been saying, okay, all-party delegation should go to Manipur. So these are largely the takeaways and the findings that the opposition MP seem to have from this visit. And so, Krita, this is the largest delegation which has visited the state since the violence broke out in May. What kind of impact do you think this visit will have? So, I'm not very sure in terms of what kind of concrete or tangible impact this may have. Because keep in mind, you know, the state has seen so many high-profile visits. The Union Home Minister had visited the state for a four-day visit at the end of May. And his visit had coincided with the second flare of violence. And during the time that he was there conducting high-level meetings, you know, there was unabated raging violence in the state and lots of people were being killed during that time. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine what kind of concrete result there might be from this trip. But yeah, they've been, what they say is that, um, you know, the new week of parliament begins on Monday and uh, with the impending discussion and on Manipur that they hope will take place. This might give the opposition some material to place before. It also is, like, like I told you earlier, it's largely to mount pressure on the government. So uh, the MPs would hope to mobilize and harness this visit. And next, we talk about a protest against China's visa practices. Last week, eight Indian athletes were scheduled to travel to the Chinese city of Chengdu to participate in the Summer World University Games. These eight athletes had been part of the Wushu contingent, which is the Chinese term for martial arts. But around the time the contingent was going to depart, India decided to withdraw the tournament. And this was because China had issued stapled visas to three athletes from the team who are from Arunachal Pradesh. To talk about this practice of stapling visas and what happened, Indian Express's Mihir Vasavda joins us. So, eight athletes, three managers and one coach, they were supposed to travel to China for the World University Games and they were supposed to travel in two batches. Uh, The first batch of five players, two managers and one coach was to leave on Thursday midnight, they had a 1.5 a.m. flight from Delhi to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Chengdu. And those players, they were just about to board the flight when they were stopped by immigration officials who just told them that we are acting on the government's instructions and you can't board this flight. They were made to wait at the airport till I think around the coach Raghavendra Singh claimed that they were made to wait at the airport till 5 a.m. before they were allowed to leave. And interestingly, none of these eight people, the five athletes, two managers and a coach, none of them were from Arunachal because the players from Arunachal were supposed to fly out the next night. But as a Wushu Federation official later said, that it was the government's decision that since the three Arunachal athletes were given stapled visa as a mark of protest, none of the Wushu players would be competing in China. Right, and Mihir, what is the difference between a stamped visa and a stapled visa? So a stamped visa is basically what you and I see usually in our passports when we are going to a particular country, right? So if you're going to the UK, you'll see a visa that's stamped on the pages of your passport. Now, stapled visa, to put it very simply, is an unstamped piece of visa. So it's basically attached to the pages of your passport with either a pin or a staple. And This is the main difference between a regular visa, which uh, is stamped on your passport, and the staple visa. Now, China has been doing this uh, to Indian citizens, primarily from Jammu and Kashmir and Arunachal Pradesh, because it sees these two regions as disputed territories. And hence, uh, it's not a practice they've started right now. It's been there since quite a few decades. It's been happening at least from 2005 onwards. And have we seen this happening in the past as well, where contingents have been withdrawn because of this practice? Right. 
So, for example, in 2011, team of karate players was going to China for, I think it was an Asian championship. And in similar circumstances, the players were stopped at the Delhi airport because the immigration officials did not allow them to travel on a stapled visa. Two years later, there were two other archers, uh, again from Marunachal Pradesh, who were participating in the World Youth Championships, and they were not allowed to travel for the same reason. Then in 2016, a badminton uh, team manager from Arunachal Pradesh uh, had to cancel his trip for similar reasons. And in those occasions, I do not recall the entire team pulling out. It so happened that the others who had the valid visa, the valid travel documents, they continued with their tour. And this time, the government uh, has decided that uh, they won't be participating the entire team rather won't be participating in the university games for China's actions. Right, and Mihir, could you tell us a bit about this tournament that this contingent was withdrawn from? So they were headed to Chenglu in China for the World University Games. This is like an Olympics of sort, but for university students. And it's a big draw. A lot of young athletes, uh, promising, upcoming and even established ones take part in this event. It's held every two years and an Indian contingent was around 227 athletes. They are participating in 11 sports. Wushu isn't among them because like we all know now, the Wushu team had to be withdrawn as a protest for China's policy of handing stapled visas to athletes from Arunachal Pradesh. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Abhishek Kumar and was produced by Utsha Sermon and me, Shashank Bharkar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com. 